وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وبارك على محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد أما بعد um, we were in the uh, lecture which we started the practical steps in how a student or how an individual can attain knowledge in our last lesson we spoke about in it we spoke about uh, the method in which a person can about the methodology that if a person takes he can attain knowledge as it should be uh, we said that manhajiyatu al-ilmiyya the practical methodological way in which a person can attain knowledge we said is by two ways the first one we spoke about is at-tadarruj fi talab that the person is gradual in, t- in, atta- in attaining knowledge and we said that five things fall under that remember we mentioned marhalatu ta'sis and then after we spoke about what marhalatu ta'sis meant and we gave an example for it we then went to marhalatu tadlil and we spoke about what mar- marhalatu tadlil means and then we mentioned the third marhala which is marhalatu ilm al muqaran and we spoke about that and what it meant and we gave an example for it and then we went into marhalatu tahrir which is the fourth Marhalatu at tahrir and then we finally moved on to the last one, which is Marhalatu uh, Takhassus. Marhalatu at Takhassus. We spoke about that, what it meant, it gave an example for it. We discussed all of this in detail. And we also spoke about the need, the necessity there is for having to be a, a, a Ishraf Ilmi. That either there's a university or an institute that plays a role in your study when you're learning. Or whether you have a shaykh which is mutqin, a shaykh who's mastered that subject, who studied it, who can go through it with you. Then we spoke about the second part that is needed if a person wants to take a correct methodology in attaining knowledge. And to be precise and accurate in knowledge, the methodology that is needed. And the second point that we mentioned was, was observing every particular mas'ala, a correct observation. And we said that this takes place in five ways as well. And we mentioned the... Mm, First one being تصور المسألة تصورا صحيحا That when you look at a mas'ala, whatever it may be, you have a correct perception of it, first of all. And we went on to the second, معرفة الحكم, knowing its ruling. And then we went on to the third, which was معرفة أدلة الأحكام, knowing the rule, evidence for that ruling. And then we mentioned in the fourth, معرفة الجوامع والفوارق بين المسائل knowing what they have in common and what the differences there are and the last point that we mentioned was معرفة مراتب المسائل knowing the levels of the matter or the issue that you are looking at now inshallah ta'ala after we finished all of that we stopped there today inshallah ta'ala my plan بإذن الله الكريم is to go through a very important point and then I'm going to go to another heading inshallah ta'ala which is to bring to your attention that the people and even the scholars they differ in terms of their understanding and their precision and their accuracy in knowledge the fahm of the ulama the scholars the scholars students of knowledge their understanding are not all the same and their precision their dubbed and how they mastered knowledge is also not the same they may share the term alim, scholar with each other. That doesn't necessarily mean they're all the same in terms of their knowledge. They're different, of different levels and different, they're di- on different scales. Because we have to understand that knowledge is bahru la sahila lahu. That knowledge is an ocean that doesn't have no shore. Knowledge does not have a shore, meaning it has no ending point. You're just going to be in that ocean forever. Once you go into knowledge, 
It's a bahrul la sahila lahu. It has no shore. A student of knowledge will struggle. He will struggle to the, get to the bottom of knowledge. Rather, it's impossible for him to do so. And every time that the student emerges deep into the ocean and he goes even more, and he goes into it even more, the more that the student of knowledge realizes how far the, 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 the bottom is. The more he goes down and the more he sinks in, the more he starts to realize that knowledge is actually further than what he thought. In simple ter terms, the water is like the mirage. The person is driving, they think they see water in front of them. Every time they come to the place, the water is still in front of them. That's how knowledge is. When you first start to see, you think you can see the ending of it. You think you know what is it that's needed from you. But when you start going in, you realize uh -uh, this is needed as well. And then it starts telling you, no, you need this one now. No, 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 this one's what you need. And the person will keep going and he wouldn't get to the bottom of it. Imam Shabi rahimahullah, he said, Al ilmu thalathatu, that knowledge is thalathatu ashbar. That knowledge is three spans. It's three hand span. Okay? Knowledge is what? It's three hand span. Knowledge. فَمَنْ نَالَ مِنْهُ شِبْرًا Anyone who attains from knowledge a hand span, the first hand span. شَبَقَ بِأَنْفِي وَظَنَّ أَنَّهُ نَالَ The person becomes arrogant and he thinks he has attained knowledge. So knowledge is three, short, three hand spans. When the person actually studies, he attains the first hand span, what happens? He becomes arrogant. That stage, the person starts to think he knows everything. He actually starts to think he's attained knowledge. He really thinks he knows. <coughs> when the person takes the second hand span of knowledge, the person's nafs becomes small to him. وَعَلِمَ And the person comes to know أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَنَلْهُ He did not attain knowledge. When he moves on to the second hand span of knowledge, the person will start to realize I, haven't, I really haven't attained knowledge. Meaning he moves on to the stage called Martabatul Tawadu. He leaves Martabatul Takabur, where he was arrogant, which was the first, and he moves on to the Marhalatul Tawadu. He moves on to the level of humility, humbleness. He becomes very humble. وَأَمَّا شِبْرُ الثَّالِثِ Then the person moves on to the third. He moves on to the third hand span. And when he moves on to the third hand span, فَهَيْهَاتَ لَا يَنَالُهُ أَحَدٌ أَبَدًا When he moves on to the third stage, he starts to actually know that he will never ever get to the bottom of knowledge. He realizes the weight, the heaviness, and he realizes that knowledge is a bahru la sahila lahu. فَهَيْهَاتَ It's impossible for, he realizes, that anyone will really attain knowledge. When that Sheikh Bakr al took the statement of Shabi, and he explained it. And in other words, meaning, he worded it differently. In his Kitab Hilya to uh, Talib al Ilm, he worded it to make you understand it. He said, Al Ilmu Thalatha to Ashbar, Man Dakhala fi Shibri al Awwal Takabara. You see? The knowledge is what? It is three hand spans. If you go in first hand span, what happens? You become arrogant. And he said, Wa Man Dakhala fi Shibri Thani. But when the person enters the second hand span, he becomes humble. And if the person enters في الشبر الثالث when he enters the third hand span, عالما he realizes أنه that he ما يعلم he knows nothing. He realizes that he actually doesn't know anything. And this brothers and sisters is where the ulama became different. Allah تبارك وتعالى he made the scholars فيما بينهم amongst themselves Allah made them different سبحانه وتعالى. In the amount which they have attained from knowledge, and the amount which they gained from knowledge, and even in the amount of their understanding and how they understood knowledge, they're different. وَلَيْسُ and they are not على حد سواء. They are not of one level, one category. They are scholars, but they're not all of one level. And the difference sometimes can be vast, it can be very great, and it can be a lot. Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah, he says in his kitab, Sayyid al-Khatir, he says, ما أكثر تفاوت الناس How great is it? It's really great. The differences that are between the people in what? في الفهوم in their understanding. The people's understanding 
and comprehension of knowledge, Ibn al Jawzi says it's, a, it's very different. It's a great difference. Hatta al ulama, even the scholars. Yatafawatuna, the scholars, they themselves are different. At tafawut al kathir, and their difference is very great. Fil usuli wal furuh. Their differences even in aqidah related issues. Not all of them understand it the same. One has a very lower level than the other. And one has a greater understanding. Even a furu' in fiqh issues, they're not all the same. One's understanding is very deep. He went a step further. He moved forward. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said something like that as well in his Jam' al-Masail. He said rahimahullah that an individual's understanding might be short um, a, a lot of people, he said, their understanding might be short in understanding what Allah and His Messenger was saying in this ayah or this hadith. And then he goes on to saying, the people's understanding, he said, it varies. It's very, it varies. And he starts to give examples, like the examples that we gave before. Dawood and Sulaiman, a father and a son, two prophets of Allah. But who had the understanding in this particular issue? وَدَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ إِذْ يَحْكُمَانِ فِي الْحَرْضِ إِذْ نَفَشَتْ فِي غَنَمُ الْقَوْمِ وَكُنَّا لِحُكْمِهِمْ شَاهِدِينَ فَفَهَّمْنَاهَا سُلَيْمَانَ We gave Sulaiman the understanding. Look what Allah said after that. وَكُلَّنْ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا Both of them we gave them knowledge. Both of them we gave them leadership. Both of them we gave them wisdom. Like who is the one who had the understanding in this particular issue? Nabi Allah is Sulaiman. And he's the son. And he's the what? He's the son of Dawood. Then you see that not everybody is the same in their understanding. Also, Ibn al Qayyim says something like that. Rahimahullah ta'ala, he says it in his Sawa'iq al Mursala, and he also says it in his Kitab, Ilam al Waqi'in, Al Rabbil Alameen. But what is it that makes the people's understanding different? Where does it go back to? What's the uh, source or the reason that makes people's understanding different? That one person understands deeper than the other person. It goes to many. But if we try to sum it down, if we try to narrow it down, if we try to bring it together, we'll say it's two. The first of them is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gifts a particular person. It's a gift, it's a muhiba. That Allah gifts a particular individual, that He gives them a sharp mind. Okay, Allah gives them a strong brain, He gives them a sharp mind, and Allah does this for whoever He will, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has never questioned why He does what He does. فَعَالُوا لِمَا يُرِيدُ لَا يُسْأَلُوا عَمَّا يَفْعَلُوا وَهُمْ يُسْأَلُونَ Allah has never questioned why He does something, but the people are questioned, the people are questioned why they do what they do. So Allah might give to a particular person an understanding which He hasn't given this particular person. <coughs> so this person understands. All of this is what? how he willed subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this scholars, they say, this is Sulaiman. Sulaiman's understanding over his father Dawood was a gifted, was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to him. And this is what the scholars call malaka. When you hear the scholars call, this person's got malaka in this issue. Huh? It means this thing has become part of him. Okay? It's a gift that Allah gave him. So if, he's, if we say he's got malaka in fiqh, he's got malaka in the Arabic language, or he's got malaka, this means that this person's ability is innate. It's an innate ability that is placed in them. It's like breathing for this person. They don't have to go out of their way. Allah gifted them, subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلِذَلِكَ الشَّيْخُ الْإِسْلَامِ تَيْمِهِ says it, he says, it is مَجْمُعُ الْفَتَاوَى He says, مِنَ الْمَعْلُومِ What is known is أَنَّ الْأُمُورَ الدَّقِيقَةَ the very minute issues. Sawa'un kanat haqqan, whether it's true. O batilan, or whether it's falsehood. Imanan, whether it's belief. O kufran, or whether it's disbelief. La tudraku, you cannot comprehend it. Illa bi dhaka'in, unless you have a, a great brain. And you have, you're smart. That's the first type. The second is, from... <coughs> what did I say it goes back to? 
the when they say it goes back to the uh, the people's understanding, it goes back to what did I say? Ah, I missed a point. A point that I missed. I said how much does it go back to? It goes back to two. The first one, sorry, brothers, is the first one is بِاعْتِبَارِ مِقْدَارُ التَّحْصِيلِ The amount that the person takes on. Okay? That's the first one. Write this down. Don't rub the first one, the one that you just wrote. You're going to come to it, inshaAllah ta'ala, what I mentioned. But the person's ability to understand over another person, or to have a greater understanding, it comes from two things. First one is, this person's ability into attaining knowledge, the patience that they endure for seeking knowledge, the effort that they exert, the fact that they are running and they are willing to attain knowledge. This is the first one. People are not the same in the amount that they can take. Sah? Somebody can take a great large of knowledge. Okay? He can take a what? A great large. He'll sit, he'll sit for six hours, seven hours and take in knowledge. One person after 45 minutes, he can't take it anymore. His brain is overloaded. He can't take it anymore. So the first one goes back to miqdaru tahsil, the amount that the person attains and the amount that the person digests and takes in. Every time the person increases knowledge and every time the person enhances in their knowledge, what also grows with it? Their understanding, it also grows with it. So they get more understanding and their perception becomes stronger. And this really goes back to high aspiration. That's the first. The second type is what goes back to the comprehension and the understanding in and within itself. It doesn't go back to your strength or your ability. It goes back to what? The capability of understanding and the understanding itself and how sharp I mean, how quick it can get into the person's mind. It goes back to the understanding itself. The people are not the same. Someone, someone might have high aspirations for six hours, he might be sitting there and another person has, he's sitting there for six hours, they both have the same aspiration, they have the same heart, but then one is taking it in faster. This goes back to what? It goes to the understanding itself. Both people are sitting in the class, but their, their, their ability to take in the information is not the same. So the second one is what goes back to the understanding itself. It doesn't go. It doesn't go back to any external your efforts or your hard work. It doesn't go back to that. This, this is two types. This goes. This one. The second type is two types. Okay, and I mentioned one of the types, which was the one I just told you, which is it's gifted. Allah gives it to you, Subhanahu wa Taala. Somebody they have never worked for it. They're just smart. They're clever. They're sharp. They may even exert less effort than other people, but it's just something Allah gave to them, subhanahu wa ta'ala. They look at something quickly, that's it, they understood it. The second one of the, that one is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows a person's understanding to enhance based on the sincerity. Allah opens their heart for them. He gives them a sharp understanding due to their sincerity, due to their truthfulness. Allah opens door for understanding which they never had before. They were not a person who could understand. But because they came with sincerity and they were truthful in what they were doing and the path that they were trying to achieve, Allah opens for them. What does He open for them? The ability to understand. Okay? It's not effort that they exerted. But because they came with sincerity, Allah Taala chose to make them understand. وَلِذَلِكَ Imam Muhammad رَحِمَهُ He was asked, Man nas'alu ba'dak, who should we ask after you? When you die, Ahmed, who should we go to and who should we ask questions? Who should we go refer back to? Ahmed said, Salu Abdullah Abdul Wahhab ibn al Warraq. Go to Abdul Wahhab ibn al Warraq, go to him and ask him. Then they said to him, Innahu dayyqul ilm, this man's na- his knowledge is very narrow. Ahmed rahimahullah, he said, Abdul Wahhab rajulun salih. Abdul Wahhab is a righteous man. مثله, somebody like him, يوفقوا لإصابة الحق. Somebody like him, he's a righteous man. Somebody like him, Allah gives him, he gives him the ability to be in the correct way. So because he has sincerity and he's a truthful man, he's a righteous individual, Allah places him upon the truth. He makes him utter the truth. Allah makes him come with the truth. 
The same is when a person is what? He's truthful, he's righteous, he's noble. Allah makes him understand. Allah Taala, He makes the person understand. This person never used to memorize properly. He couldn't. He used to try and try and try. But when he came with sincerity, he said, oh Allah, I'm doing this for your sake. And he came with sidq. Allah Taala opened his brain for him. And he allowed him to what? To memorize. And then, when you look at the ulama and the people generally, and you want to know whose understanding is, why is he higher than another person? People always think it's because Allah gifted this person. They always run to that one. Wallahi, this person is a genius. Allah Mubarak is a genetic thing. He was born that way. It's just the way Allah created him. And that's not the case. <coughs> there are other things that are needed as well. That is one. That is one. A person can understand and have strong understanding based upon what? Tawfiqun min Allah. Allah gives him tawfiq. Allah gives him the ability, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah opens for him doors based on his ikhlas and based on his sitq, how truthful he is. Okay? And also, the first one which I mentioned, which is that the person, he nurtures himself upon high aspiration. He's strong, he wakes up, he knows it's the morning class, and he comes, he sits down, he gets his pen and paper out, he writes, and he exerts a lot of effort into it to try to what? To understand. He doesn't leave this place unless he understood it. The precision, brothers, now that we've mentioned that, the precision and the understanding and the comprehension that a person has of a mas'ala is of two types. When can we actually say this person is precise? Allah mubarak, he is on point. He is a person who has dabt and itqan. He's mastered. He is actually precise in knowledge. Allah mubarak, we can actually say that about him is when two things are in place for him. Al-Ula, the first of them is Dabtul Mas'ala. This Mas'ala, he has narrowed it down. He's got this Mas'ala, this particular issue, he's understood it very well. I already spoke about that, right? What we mean by, remember when we're speaking about Ma'rifatul, Ma'rifatul, knowing, how to observe a particular mas'ala. Remember we mentioned some things that are needed from you. The first one was being tasawwur al-mas'ala, tasawwur al-sahihan. The first one, the first one. That I just mentioned. Dabtul mas'ala, that you master the mas'ala. Remember we said five things is needed from a person. The first one is tasawwur al-mas'ala, tasawwur al-sahihan. That you first of all perceive the thing properly. Okay, I'll give an example. If the scholars, they speak about the issue of masu al-dhakar, Touching your private part. <coughs> does it break wudu or does it not break wudu? The question here is, first of all, before we go into the ruling, or does it not? Or does it? The question is, what do the scholars mean by mess? What does mess actually mean? When the scholars they say dakar, do they also mean the qubul of the mar'a as well? When they say mess, what does the word mess go towards? Touching your private part. That the Arabs use the word mess touching through a ha'il, through a object, or do they mean direct contact? What do they mean by, first of all, let's perceive the issue, before we go to the ruling. As we said before, al hukm ala shay' far'un al tasawuri. Because to place a ruling on a matter, you first need to have correct perception. What do you need? Correct perception. So first of all, let's discuss that. Remember brothers, we spoke about this before. Now when the person says, okay, yes, this is what mess means, that the Arabs, when they use the word mess, and the fuqaha are speaking about this issue, that they mean by this, biduni ha'il, it's without a, without a barrier. Mm, okay, good. What do they mean by when they say, dhakar? They also mean the qubul of the mar'a. And this is min babi taghlib. The women also falls under it. You have to first of all agree on the perception first. Then we say, mm. now that we've agreed on that, because there's no point me saying mess with dhakar, and he has another understanding of what is meant by Masu al-Dhakar. He's talking about Mas which is through Ha'il. Or he's talking about the Qubul of the Mar'a is not in the word Dhakar. Then our, our discussion is going to be different. Okay? So we mentioned that already before. Then when the person does that, he understands the picture and he understands what is talk, what's, what's been spoken about. Then he says the ruling based on what I've understood from this Mas'ala and I have to, I've done tasawwur on is that it is Naqidhul Wudu'. 
that it nullifies the person's wudu. It breaks, it breaks the person's wudu. Okay. The third stage is, okay, what's the evidence for it? Okay, what's the evidence for it? The evidence is the person is Anyone who touches his private part, then he should what? He should do wudu. Based on the hadith of the Prophet then the person goes back to the watch with Dalala. Okay, how did you extract the ruling out of the hadith? Where did you get this from? And because the Prophet ﷺ commanded us, that the command from the Prophet it shows obligation. That you have to. Because the Prophet commanded us. That's a principle according to the scholars. This person here right now, he knows what? He knows what? He knows the perception of this mas'ala, which is the first one I'm talking about. Dabtul mas'ala. He's mastered the mas'ala. You know, he's got it. That's the first one, brothers. Are we all together? Dabtul mas'ala. That those five points that we mentioned, it's in place. The second type of dabt, um, precision, or even uh, accuracy and itqan of a mas'ala is that the person has what? Salamatu dalili wal jawabi anil mu'arid. This is rare that you find anyone having this one now. Which is what? That your evidence is, is safe from any opposition. And even if opposition come, and even if opposition does come, you know how to respond to it. This now is a level of bump precision that many can't go towards. Many people know their ruling, they know their mas'ala, they master this particular issue, they know what it's about, the do's and the don'ts, and the ruling for it, and that. They can talk about it. But what they can't do is, and they struggle greatly with, is the second type. Which is, salamatu dalil That this evidence is free from what? That this evidence is what? It's free from any opposition. And if you find any opposition on it, that you're able to respond to it fast. That you can give an answer to it. Not many are able to do that. وَلِذَلِكَ شَيْخُ الْإِسْلَامِ Ibn Taymiyyah says in his Majmu'u Al-Fatawa, لا بد من ذكر الدليل والجواب عن المعارض. شيخ الإسلام تيمي says this. He said it's necessary, it's required to mention the evidence for yourself and to respond to any opposing other ideas. That is where the people go different. Do you see it, brothers? The reason why scholars would be different in their levels is some people's dubbed, okay, and their precision and their accuracy of knowledge and their, their understanding of it is on the first level. They know what's for them. They've perceived this issue very well. They know the ruling pertaining to it. They know its evidences. They know even the levels of prohibitions when they come and they try to, which one is which. They know the jawami and the furuq, the differences that they know of all of that. The only difference they can't is if an oppos opposing person comes Let's give an example for this issue that we're speaking about, uh, the, the, the issue of If the person brings the hadith of the Prophet where he said, where the Prophet sallallahu said, uh, that this your private part is just a part of you. When the Prophet said to the companion, that all your private part is, when the man said to the Prophet, oh Messenger of Allah, shall I do wudu? Shall I do wudu? After I touch my private part, what did the Prophet say to him? Verily, that your private part is what? So, bilba'atu minka is a part of you. This person hasn't reached that level to respond to that. He hasn't got the ability to do that. And he won't speak about that. He can't. He's only at the first stage of precision. He's at that first level where he's mastered his mas'ala that he's talking about. He can tell you the surah of it. He can give you the tasawwur, which is sahih. He's able to give you the hukum pertaining to this issue. He can give you the delil that's needed in this particular issue. He can give you the wajhud dalal and how to extract the ruling from the evidence. He does, does all of that. He knows all of that. But he doesn't have the ability to what? To respond. Respond. To what? To respond to counter. Counter evidences. And the evidence that are against, against what he's upon. وَلِذَلِكَ Knowing. Knowing what is for you which is the first type, which is dabtul mas'ala. Knowing its ruling, knowing its just having a tasawwur of it, having, knowing its evidences and etc. That is the lowest form of dabt. That is the lowest what? It's the lowest form of precision. It's the lowest, you've got precision, but it's the lowest form. 
It's the what? It's the lowest form. Above that is darajat, or stations above that. And that is by what? Doing what? Isti'abul athar. The person goes out of his way and he increases on the evidences for himself. And he also increases in the evidences that oppose him. He actually does more research. He does more research in, that, in the particular issue. Are we all together? He also has what? He also increases in observation and analyzing the same evidence that he once had, trying to extract other things from it and trying to see more from it. Also, reading the opposing opinions out there that are mentioned by the scholars, the responses that were given to them, the evidences that they brought forward, and etc. This is what? It's an extra level now. It's an extra level. For example, today you might find, just to clarify the matter even more, you might find, for example, the people of innovation. For example, an Ash'ari, مثلاً, who is built. He's what? He's got dabt, he's got precision. What's his dabt like in? Dabtul li madhabi. He has the dabt of his madhab. He has, he has the tasawwur that's needed. He knows the evidence that's for him. Of a so-called evidence. He knows the ruling in this particular issue for him. He has the levels, he knows what to dalal and etc. He knows everything for himself. He's dabt. Are we all together? He's got dabt. He's mastered that. He's got that first level which is dabtul mas'ala. He will speak about the his Ari from the Aqwali. He knows the statements that have come from his A'imma. He knows where they differ amongst themselves. He knows within his madhab. And he knows that. But he's not got dubbed of the opposing views. He hasn't got dubbed of the opposing views. For example, Salamatu, Al Dalil, Wal Jawabu Al Mu'arid. That there's no opposing evidences against your point. A lot of the people don't know that. So what happens in a lot of the discussions that you see today, debates and discussions that you see, two people who might know their own madhabs properly are discussing something. Not one of them can respond to the other one. Each one is just stating what is for them. Will they ever get anywhere? I'll get anywhere. And it's a person who knows their madhab in the debate and also knows the madhab of the person who's speaking more than them or like them. The minimum that you would need in order to debate a person is that you know their madhab as much as they know it. <coughs> or even more. Or even? Or even more. You either have to be the same as them or more. And you have to know your one. You have to know? You have to know your one. But if your understanding of your madhab is good, Allahumma barik, and you're strong at it, but you can't respond to these points, the debate is not for you. You're dabit of the first, you have dabit of the mas'ala. Amma salamatu al-dalil wal jawabu al mu'arid, this is not for you. That is, this is not for you. <coughs> when well, the scholars sometimes, when they mention faham, understanding, the ulama, when they mention the word al-faham, Sometimes they mean by faham and dabt, what we mentioned before. What do they call faham? Al dabt. The two types that we mentioned of dabt. Dabdu, al mas'ala, and also the salamatu dalil, wal jawabu al mu'arid. Those two that I mentioned. They might call it uh, faham. A person has an understanding, mashallah. And sometimes the scholars. They don't mean that by faham. That's not what they mean faham. The faham that they mean here is isabatul haq that the person is in line with the truth. They got it right. They are the one who are right. That word faham is used in this regard as well. When the person is given the tawfiq and the ability to be in line with what is right, this is called what? Al-fahm. When we sometimes they we say they have understanding. So we, we say we don't have understanding, but they have their aqwal and they have books and they've read and they researched and they looked into it. We mean the second type, which is what? They've got what? Allah has given them a tawfiq ul sawabi. They are not in line with what's right. So then we say they don't have understanding. 
Because what's it going to benefit you? If what you're saying is so much information, you have so much statements of the scholars, and you have their words, and what they said, and you can speak about all of it, but all of it is wrong, it's null and void. It's not what Allah meant, and it's not what the Prophet meant. Is that fahm? It's really not fahm. Does that make sense? It's not what? It's not fahm. And then what we learned here, as a side, all of this was a side point, was that people's understanding are different. And there are causes that make people's understanding different. Sometimes that under, the lack of understanding, it goes back to your, you, you, as an individual, your laziness. And you can't be bothered. You don't want to do it. It's not because the information is hard necessarily, but you're just not in the mood of learning. You're not like that. It could go back to that sometimes. And sometimes it could just actually go back to uh, the knowledge, the understanding itself. Of course, it's different. Two people might wake up, come out from the same room, brothers, and they come to class and they both listen. And just one understands and the other one is just going over his head. They've both come the first day. They've both never studied this before. But it's something Allah gifts him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or one that one of them might come with a sincere heart and he might come with sidq. He may not even be the genius one, but he's got ikhlas and he's got sidq. You see that person is going to re re reach what? He's going to get it right majority of the time. He's going to get it right the majority of the time. Because guess what? He goes where the evidence goes. He doesn't really have an agenda behind the, the way he looks at everything. It's sincere. All this is for Allah wa ta'ala. Allah wa ta'ala's sake. Here I want to speak about brothers. If we go back to the first type of dabtul mas'ala, remember what I just mentioned? How many, the top dabt is what? Two types, right? The first is that you understand your mas'ala. What are the things that can aid you, support you in that regard? Okay, there are things that can aid you. If you come with, it will aid you to have that dabtul mas'ala. I already told you dabtul mas'ala means you have five things. We spoke about that already. But what is it that can aid me and help me to come with that I can have dabdul mas'ala? Before I even talk about salamatul dalil wal jawabi anil mu'arid, responding to the opponents and what they said. First of all, you have to have precision in your own, in the own information, right? The mas'ala at hand. The things that help you, brothers, is, is the following. Number one is at tarkizu ala al matin al madrus. The matin, I mean, the book, the text that you're studying, this text that you're studying in every single level. We're going to speak about different levels, inshallah ta'ala. i am already spoke about different levels, remember? Marhalatu. What was the first one? Marhalatu ta'sis. Sah brothers. Marhalatu ta'sis was the, was the first thing that we mentioned that the person comes with. And then we said marhalatu tadlil. And then marhalatu ilm al muqaran And then we spoke about marhalatu tahrir. And then marhalatu takhassus. These were different levels, right? These were what? There were different levels. We already spoke about it in our previous, previous lesson. All of those levels, there are books that you're going to study with a shaykh. Whether it be in a university or whether it actually be with a shaykh. That book which you're studying, in each of those five levels that I mentioned, you try to memorize them. What do you try to do? You memorize it. You give importance to memorizing it. You also try to exert a great effort in understanding that particular text. Don't jump from one text to another text. Don't jump from one text to another text. And say that I've done this for a bit, you know, I'm going to start doing another one, I want to do this one. one. No, stick to the text that you're studying. Okay? Also, don't mix that particular subject. If you're studying, مثلا, you're studying right now uh, الوراقات, مثلا, in Usul al-Fiqh. Okay? Or, مثلا, you're studying Nahu, you're studying Ajrumiya. Remember, Ibn Ajur Ramiya. You're studying that book. So what happens? You go out to another class and you study Nahu al wadh on the side as well. It's the same subject, right? So you're studying Ajrumiyah here, Ama Ajurramiyah, and here what are you studying? You're studying Nahu al wadh They're both the same subject, they're both grammar. So what happens to the person? The person gets confused. It's good that the person doesn't, if it's the same subject, if it's the same field, you do one book. You don't bring another, another same book in that. 
Because this, what, what does it do to you? You shut it with dhihm. It scatters your brain all over the place. And it makes you, it weakens your dhabt and your precision. Stick with one book. Give importance to that particular matter that you're studying. And don't look at other, other, other books. Make sure that you're t studying with a person who knows that subject very well, who's good at it, who's very good at it, who's mastered it, who's st strong at it. Also, at that same time that you're studying it, avoid going too much off topic. Your concern and your mission for every level is that you've understood the text. Some people, they confuse the difference between the text and the sharah of the book. Your importance, brothers, what is important to you is, if, for example, you're studying a Jurramiya or you're studying a Jurumiya. If you're studying a Jurramiya right now, your concern should be the metan. Your, the metan. What does the author mean when he says, Al-Kalamu huwa al-lafdu al-murakkab al-mufidu bil wadu What does he mean by that? You understand word for word what he means by that. Don't confuse yourself with the Sharah Tuhfat al Saniyah, the Sharah Muqaddimah al Ajurramiyah. Don't confuse yourself with that. And don't go into that and look at the Sharah. Especially when you're trying to understand a book that you're studying with a Sheikh, don't even buy the Sharah. Don't buy. Don't buy the Sharah. Buy the text alone. Bring it to the classroom. Read the text on him. Then later, when you go to the Sharah and you've understood the text, it will be like water for you. When it will, it will be so, it will flow for you. So this first point that will help you, brothers, is At-Tarkiz. You give a lot of importance. You exert your efforts on the matter that you're studying with the Shaykh. Each level. Every level, the books that are being taught, you give them a lot of importance. وَحِفْظِ مَسَائِلِهِ And you try to memorize the masail that are in it. You memorize it. We'll speak about the memorization a bit later. دَلَائِلِهِ وَتَلْخِيصِهَا Another thing you need to do as well in this level is that that particular book that you studied, try to summarize it. Bullet points. Every chapter that you do, Kitab al-Tahara. What did the teacher teach you? He said so many things, right? Summarize the whole chapter. The ending, make a little part for it where you summarize the whole chapter of Kitab al-Tahara. Summarize it. What will it benefit you? لِيَسْهُلَ مُرَاجَعَتُهَا When you want to go back later to revise it, it's so easy. Because each point that you bullet pointed, under it, so much things are going to come to your mind. Mm, okay. Brothers, are you with me? Because when you prepare a khutbah to Jum'ah, do you think you write everything you're going to say? No. You write an ayah or a hadith, or you just write a word or two on the, on the paper. Just so when you're given the khutbah, you look at that, it reminds you of all of the things that you want to say. It gives you a chain of thoughts, true or false. That's just what, that's just what, that's, it's, that is what it's meant to be. It isn't meant to be that the person keeps looking at the paper all day, where they can't lift their head because... The, no. The paper is actually meant to just be, when you look at it, it just reminds you of the point that you want to say. I mean, the evidence that you want to extract. Just reminds you, sometimes when you come, you lose that chain of thought. What do you lose? The chain of thought, your mind goes everywhere. The paper is to remind you what to do. The same is when you want to, when you study a subject. You've been studying this chapter, Kitab al-Tahara, let's say for a month, okay? And once after you finish a month, what information has the teacher been saying every day in that month? So much. He's been saying a lot of things. Are you able as an individual to remember everything he said? Word for word? But if you bullet point it and you summarize it, each, and you make it small points, Whenever you look at it, you remember all the things he said under this point. And he said all the things he said under it. As you can summarize three, 30 days or a month's class into a page or two. This shows what? This shows that you've understood this subject now. I mean, this particular chapter. But the Dalek and the scholars, they say, any book that you've studied and any book that you've read that you can't summarize is not a book you've understood. Two things if you can do to a book that you've studied, a book that you've read, if you can do two things to that book, you've truly understood that book. You can put that book away and inshaAllah ta'ala you've understood it. What is it? You can summarize that book. You can summarize that book. 
Remember, summary means you don't get rid of information which is vital. You have to just get rid of what the Sheikh is saying that's repeti repetitive. Okay? How would you know what's repetitive? Unless you've really understood it. What is he repeating here that's already said? You're getting rid of that. Again, what you're going to have to, the ability that comes with uh, summarizing a book is that the statement that you're going to take out and the parts that you're going to stitch together have to be flowing. That's a flow. It's a lot of effort that is exerted inside summarizing. It's not just an easy job. It's not an easy job. The second thing that you, you should be able to do is you have to be able to rewrite the content page for that book. If you could do content page for the book and make your own fahras, your own content page for that book, it shows you've understood the book. So if you've done a, your own content pages, then the headings are going to be from you as well. Because what does that actually show? That this whole five, six pages, the Sheikh was speaking about this particular issue. You've understood it. This is, this is the main point that he's focusing on. True or false? And then those two things is an indication that you've understood that book. That you what? You understood that book. And later when you want to go back to referencing that book or you want to ex extract a, a code that you once read from it, you're not going to go to the whole book. You're just going to go to the fahras that you wrote at the beginning of the book. The fahras. And you're just going to quickly reference it. And say, Your research is going to be so fast. If a person goes, can you talk about this topic tomorrow? You're easy, you can easily put it together. Reason is because you've got a content page for just about every book that you've read. Very important. Organized. Now, the second thing that helps you and it aids you is Al-Hirsu al al -hibd. I mentioned it before, but now I'm going to mention it independently, which is importance to memorize. Ya ikhwan, memorization is very important. If a person doesn't memorize brothers, and he doesn't memorize three things, three things, while seeking knowledge, then he's not going to get anywhere. The first thing that you memorize the masail, the mas'ala, you memorize it. That the scholars are talking about the whole mess and you memorize it. This means you're memorizing text. What are you memorizing? Texts. Because when, for example, you have to memorize nawaqidul wudu, مثلاً. That's a text. That's a masala. All the things that nullify the salah. You need to know it. What's it? Number one. Number two. Hey, number three. How much is it? You need to tell me. How much? Okay, good. What are shuruq la ilaha illallah? What are the conditions of la ilaha illallah? You need to memorize each one. That's the first one. You memorize the mas'ala. The second thing that you need to memorize is the hukum pertaining to that mas'ala. The ruling pertaining to that mas'ala. Is it halal? Is it haram? Is it wajib? Is it not? To memorize the hukum pertaining to that. There's no point you knowing all of that, but you don't remember what's the ruling regarding it. The third thing that you memorize is the evidence. The evidence is pertaining to that. And the evidences are what? Three things. I'm a four if we say. What are they? Al Quran. The person memorizes the Quran off the top of their head. Are we all together? Some of the scholars they used to say, memorizing the Quran is not a student of knowledge. It's been before seeking knowledge. So even before you become a student of knowledge, you memorize the Quran. You're not considered a student of knowledge. That should be from the norms. The, the baker, the shopkeeper, the guard, those people all have to try to memorize the Quran. Okay? Are we all together? Anyone who says to you, Wallahi brothers, I'll tell you this. Anyone who tells you, that you don't need to memorize the Quran, you don't forget it. Draw yourself, don't worry. You want to learn the religion? Just read these books, study this class and stuff. They've deceived you, they've lied to you. Lied to you. And I, I will reassure you one thing. Wherever years go by, you'll look at that person and you'll really hate them from the bottom of your heart. When you reach an age where you can't no longer memorize the Quran, become tired and you're fatigued and you're old and the responsibilities have become a lot on you, you will realize that this individual has deceived you. Ikhwan, learning the Quran is asas. That's why all this time I haven't spoken about memorizing the Quran. The reason is because it shouldn't be an issue of bringing it into seeking knowledge. It's way before that. Are we all together? It's from the asas, from the foundation. We're talking about a person who wants to seek knowledge. Okay? Seek, the Quran is before seeking knowledge. It's something even the ones who don't want to seek knowledge. The Ammatun Nas, the people from the streets should try to memorize the Quran. So we say, forget a student of knowledge who wants to extract ruling from the Quran and the Sunnah. So the third one is, brothers, 
and the dalil. The person tries to memorize the evidences. The evidence I said is four. Al Quran. The person memorizes the Sunnah. And we'll speak about the books that they should try to memorize. But they should memorize Arba'in Nawi, the 40 Hadith of Nawi. They should try to memorize Umdatul Hakam or Bulughul Maram. They try to memorize these books. Because Bulughul Maram is a Hadithul Ahkam. A Hadithul Ahkam are what? Hadiths which are pertaining to jurisprudent rulings. Sah? So the person will know if somebody asked him matters pertaining to fiqh issues, he would have the evidence quickly. Because he studies, or he memorized Bulugh al Maram, or he memorized Umdat al Hakam, or Al Muharrar ibn Abdul Hadi, or the Muntaqa. He'll memorize those books, he could do ishtihadar of it. And I truly advise anybody to memorize Bulugh al Maram. Yes, that's it, laugh for them. Bulugh al Maram. And we'll speak about in more detail. So if the person memorizes the Quran, and they memorize Bulugh al Maram, and if they add on to that after finishing Arba'in al Nawi, Bulugh al Maram, and the person adds on to that Riyadh al Salihin. The reason why I say Riyadh al Salihin, brothers, is because Riyadh al-Salihin is a book if you want to give a lecture, if you want to give a reminder, if you want to talk about heart softening, if you, it's a book that is amazing in that field. Nawawi rahimahullah, he has brought powerful ahadith in there. Okay? We all together. Lakin, Riyadh al-Salihin and Bulugh al-Maram are different. The, the book, the hadith are different. Bulugh al-Maram is specific to fiqh related hadith. Uh, doesn't talk about heart softening or anything like that. No, no. It's specific to what? Fiqh related issue. At the ending, of course, half the Hajar, he brings, of course, the etiquettes and that's the, the manners that are needed. Uh, he, he concludes with Kitab, which is Jami', where he brings other points on the side. But generally, the book is written based upon a Hadith al The person memorizes it. So, those are the three things that you memorize as a student of knowledge Masail, the Mas'ala, you memorize the Hukum, the ruling for it. Okay, and you try to memorize who said that this, this is the evidence for it. Okay, when we say the hukum as well, remember you learn the word dalal and how to extract the evidence from the evidence that falls under the hukum as well. And the evidence itself. Those three is what's needed from the student. The memorization comes through two ways. There's two types of memorization. There's what? Two types of memorization. A first type is called a hifdun nas. What is it called? The person goes home, they sit down, and they memorize it word for word. They write it a hundred times, two hundred times, it doesn't matter. They write it so many times. They read it, they write it again, they read it, they write it again, they read it, they write it again, they read it. And it sticks onto their long term memory. And the person her holds it word for word. This is the first type, which all, everyone here knows. This one, where does it come through? It comes through with takrar. Repetition and reading and going over it and going over it again. It's the way that the people memorize the Quran, the way that the people should memorize the hadith of the Prophet, and how the people memorize the mutun and the mandumat, uh, poetries and etc. That is the first type. The second type is called hifdu bilistidhar. What does it mean? It means this person didn't go out of their way to memorize it. But because this person, Matalan, has been reading this book so many times okay or they be coming to this class so many times or the fact that this person has been teaching this book for so many times he's taught it so many times it's now kind of stuck to his head okay it's got, got stuck to his brain this is a person who is known to do adam and nadar he's been consistent in observing in the books he does a lot of muraja'ah, revision. This is what he does. Taqlibu safahati. He turns over pages a lot and keeps looking at it. Bain al wal ukhra From time to time. That's what he does. Then this person, even though he may not get it word for word, he won't be able to. Because he didn't do hifdhu nas But he, had, he has what is known as istihdhar. He has, he has a, the 80% of the wordings are with him. ولذلك محمد بن أبي حاتم، the student of الإمام الش the student of the الإمام البخاري رحمه الله محمد بن الدريس الشافعي، sorry محمد بن إبراهيم محمد بن إسماعيل بن إبراهيم البخاري رحمه الله الإمام البخاري student محمد بن أبي حاتم، he said 
Qultu li Muhammad ibn Ismail. I said to Imam al-Bukhari, I asked him, Yawman, alone, I was privately with him. No one else, me and him. I said to him, Hal min dawa'in yashrabuhu al-rajul? Is there a medicine that a person can take فَيَنْتَفِعُ بِهِ لِلْحِفْظِ that can help his memorization? Is there a medication that you would give and you would prescribe? And if a person takes, it will help with their memorization. Now the reason why that question will be asked to Imam al-Bukhari is because he was he was half a mutqin, thabt. His memory was beyond comprehension. So look what he said, rahimahullah. So is it anyone better than him to tell us where the answer for this question is? He said, Rahimahullah, فَقَالَ لَا أَعْلَمُ I don't know any medicine a person can take, or medication that a person can be upon. So he went quiet for a bit. ثُمَّ أَقْبَلَ عَلَيَّ وَقَالَ Then Bukhari turned towards his student, uh, Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim, <coughs> and he said to him, لَا أَعْلَمُ شَيْئًا I do not know a matter. I don't know anything more beneficial for memorization greater than what? The person's love and passion for knowledge and also the consistent looking repetition. Person when they want something and they're driven, they're hungry for something and the second thing is that the person has mudawabat al nadar consistently is overlooking this issue, he's looking at it, he's, he's sorry, he's looking over it, he's looking over it again and again and again and again, he's going over it so many times, he's not stopping. A week back, he comes back again. Another a week comes back, he does it again. A lot of people come up to you, me sometimes and they say to me, I tried to memorize this book, Wallah I couldn't. The biggest mistake that they've done was they try to do it all in one sit. Doing it 10 hours in one sit is better that you divide that 10 hours. You do every day an hour. You do every day an hour for 10 days. It's much better than when you do it 10 hours in one sit. We all together brothers? The reason is because every single day it will feel like it's the first time. Feel like I've necessarily memorized it. Coming back again, I just memorized it. What happened? It bounced off the brain because of the stress and the thought and whatever's in your head. So you separate those 10 hours and you divide it into 10 different days. Then it will go into your brain. And that is, that's what he meant. لا أعلم شيئا أنفع للحفظ من نهمة الرجل ومداومة النظر. The person has to have high aspiration, has to have that lofty uh, drive and that want and that hunger for knowledge. And he also has to have kathir al-nadari fil masail wal kutub. The person has to look at books a lot, observe them, and consistently be looking at it. Don't give, uh, don't dismiss it. Walidharika, the Salaf, they used to know the importance of memorization. Khalil ibn Ahmad al-Farahidi, when he spoke about the importance of seeking knowledge, and when he talked about the importance of memorizing for a student of knowledge, he said, he said, al-ihtifad bima fi sadrik awla min darsi ma fi kutubik. He said, <coughs> memorizing, I'm a keeping, sorry, sorry, he said, keeping what's in your heart takes more precedence than studying what's in books. In other words, what you've already memorized to make sure that it doesn't go outside your heart takes more precedence than taking new information on board. Are we all together? It's very powerful. Also, Abdul Razak ibn Hammam as he said, Kullu ilmin la yadkulu ma'a sa'ibihi al-hammam fala ta'udduhu ilma. Abdul Razak ibn Hammam as Shaykh Imam Ahmed. Imam Ahmed Shaykh. He said, any no, uh, whichever all sorry kullu ilm any any knowledge la yadkhul ma'a sahibi that does not enter the toilet with the person is is not knowledge when you go to the toilet the knowledge that doesn't go with you to the toilet is not knowledge don't consider that to be your knowledge it's not yours and we all together 
The knowledge that you know is when you go to the toilet, what you got? Nothing. You're by yourself. What you can say at that point, what you can speak about that point is the knowledge you have. And what you've memorized then and then is what you know. That's what your knowledge is. That's what you can claim. Okay? Not what's in your library, not what's in your books, not in the notes that you wrote. No. وَلِذَلِكَ عُبَيْدُ اللَّهِ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ said أَلَّيْسَ بِعِلْمَ مَا حَوَاهُ الْقِمِطْرِ It is not knowledge what, are, what is written in scrolls and books. That's not knowledge. مَا الْعِلْمُ Knowledge is nothing إِلَّا مَا حَوَاهُ إِلَّا مَا حَوَاهُ الصَّدْرُ Knowledge is nothing except that which the chest has held. What's in your heart. That's what real knowledge is. That is what? That is what his real knowledge is. Because what's outside, we all share it. You got books, I can go buy them tomorrow, inshallah. It's just money. You just beat me, bought them. You got a bigger library than I am, just a couple of days, inshallah ta'ala, put money together, buy a big library. I can make a library, sah? I can buy all the books that you have. I can buy better publications that you have, sah? The true knowledge is, if and somebody can take it from you, that book can be lost, your notes can be lost, you can lose all of that. So the scholars say that's not knowledge. Knowledge is truly what comes with you wherever you go, wherever you stand, wherever situation that you're in, what you can say, what you can articulate, what you have in your chest, that's what you can claim. That's your knowledge. That is your, that is your knowledge. Hafiz al-Imam Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, rahimahullah, he said al-hifdu al-itqan. He went in more details. What's the, what is real knowledge? What you memorize, right? And what is it that you memorize? What does it mean, memorization? He said, Al-Sitqan. It's something you don't need to think when you say it. It just flows off your tongue. That's what Hifd is to hear them. Those scholars, Hifd meant the person doesn't think. As soon as you ask him, he reads it to you. It's on the tip of his tongue. To them, that's what's. Also, the word Itqan doesn't involve just that ability to say that. It also means the person has fahm. The word Itqan involves understanding as well. That the person isn't just a parrot. He just memorizes everything he's saying it. That the person has Itqan, meaning he's mastered, them under, he's, un, he's mastered it. He's got the precision of it. And then the Salaf, Hifd was not just Mujarrad. It wasn't Mujarrad al alfaz It wasn't just the mere letters and the words that the person does. I'm a Hifd Mujarrad al nusus That the person just memorizes so much nas, so much text, so much different books. Different publications. لا سلف to them was what? مصحوبا بالفهم. It was accompanied with understanding. That the person has with their memory understanding. That's what Abdurrahman Mahdi's statement is. When he said, الحفظ الإتقان is to actually master it. <coughs> when Muhanna asked Al Imam Ahmed rahimahullah about memorization, what is it? He said to him, الإتقان هو الحفظ. إتقان here means حفظ النصوص. Mas'uban bil fahmi. Is that the person has what? That the person has memorization of the text. He has a word with him. And he also understands what he's saying. That is what's meant by it. That is what he was saying, Rahimahullah. The third thing that will help us, brothers, and that will aid us, is. عدم الانتقال من مرحلة إلى مرحلة. I kind of touched on it before, but I'm going to make it its own heading, which is don't move from one stage to another stage. Okay. Before I spoke about don't move from one book to another book. Here I'm talking about if you're in the مرحلة التأسيس, you're in the stage where foundation is being made for you. You're on that first level, مرحلة التأسيس. Don't jump to مرحلة التدليل. Okay. Or مرحلة التحرير. You're on the first level. Okay, you're at the position where you're grounding yourself. Don't get excited and see a book with three volumes and say, and somebody tells you what the book was, what this book talks about, and you get over excited and say, SubhanAllah, I want to start this book. I really want to start. Wow, this is the book I love. No. You're at a stage right now. Do what you're upon. And don't move from that particular marhala to another marhala. Don't move from one metan to another metan. Unless you've mastered the one before that. If you don't have dhabt of the previous book, and you don't have tamakkun, you're not strong on the previous book, 
then there's no way you should go to the next book. Because guess what? The next book is relying on a person who's understood the previous book. The information that's going to be in the second book is a greater and a more information that you should have taken from the first book. If you did not understand Ajrumiya, trying to understand Qatrul Nada is going to destroy you. It's going to what? Destroy you. You have to understand Ajrumiya and know what the author of Ajrumiya is trying to say. And we're all together. Reading the Kitab Talbis Al Jahmiya by Shaykh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah when you haven't done Qawa'il, Qawa'id Al Aqeedat Al Wasatiya, Al Hamawiya, Al Tadmuriya, or Shaykh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, going to his Talbis Jahmiya, it's going to confuse you. It's an ocean. Reading his Dar'u Ta'arud Al Aqlu Al Naqal, when you haven't done his Aqeedat Al Wasatiya, you, you haven't done his Hamawiya and Tadmuriya, you're going to be confused. Okay? The person shouldn't move from one book to another book. He shouldn't move from one level to another level unless that person has mastered that particular level which they're in. First of all, master the previous one. Understand it properly. Go into it very well. Digest it. By doing what? By memorizing its masail, memorizing its ahkam, memorizing the evidence pertaining to that. Don't move if you haven't done that. Then move on to the second level. We'll stop there inshallah ta'ala and we'll carry on the remaining bi idhnillah al kareem tomorrow. We'll finish it all bi idhnillah al kareem tomorrow. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and shaitan and Allah's messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh.